Okay, Stacy, we can begin the meeting. Thank you. All right, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Stacy Manna, and I am the Community Outreach Director for Pandas Network. It is an honor for me to welcome you all here today. The new research that Dr. Drayton Agayu will present to us is so incredibly important for our pandas and pans community, as well as the autoimmune community in general. Uh, some of the most frequent questions that we receive when we talk with parents are things like, what will it take to get insurance coverage? Or what will it take to get more doctors to treat this disorder? Diagnostic blood work, consistent treatment protocol, and the answer is research. Research opens the door to these things that we all want to achieve so badly for our families. Your understanding of this research and the potential it has will be important to speak to and share with your medical teams and your communities. So having this knowledge, we strongly believe will be a very powerful tool for you. After the lecture, Dr. Agai will answer several of the emailed questions. And then we will also open the chat box for any additional questions as time allows. We certainly won't get to all of them just due to time constraints, but within the next two weeks, we will email everyone here a copy of the recording as well as answers to any of the remaining questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Diana Pullman, our founder and executive director of Pandas Network. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a great evening. Thank you for being here today. We are a nonprofit that was founded 10 years ago by parent advocates and doctors and researchers like Dr. Agayu, who was finishing his PhD at the time that we founded uh, this nonprofit. Currently, PANDAS is a rare disease. Founding of donations, from parents allows us to expedite research and allows Pandas Network to stay afloat. So thank you very much for your care and attention over the years. Look, uh, we received about a hundred emails before this conference with people worried about the outcome of their children's lives. We'll try to answer some of those questions tonight, but I want you to know that both Stacy and I have two children that had Pandas and Pans. They're doing really well. She has young um, school-aged children. I have children that are now 18 and 23 years old. So with understanding that this is an inflammatory disease and treating it, we can heal children. Today, the prime point of the research that Dr. Agayu is going to point out is about how infection triggers an autoimmune response in a person's body and in the mouse model body and how that impacts the blood-brain barrier. This research was incredibly important to have uh, finished so that the National Institute of Mental Health, the NIH, researchers, and other clinicians will better serve our children. So um, don't give up. We will continue to answer your questions and have future webinars. And without any further delay, Dr. Jutan Agayu, thank you so much for being here from Columbia University, and we look forward to your lecture. Um, I need the, to be allowed to share the screen. Yes. Right uh, should be happening now. Okay. Um, so first, thank you, Diana, for that wonderful, and Stacy for the wonderful introduction and for organizing this webinar. So I, I basically come here uh, with two hats. One is the scientist hat, um, who have been passionate about uh, research on pandas and pans since I started my laboratory at the University of California in Irvine in 2000. And um, that, was, that was 2011. And that uh, basically the second hat is, I serve as the chief scientific officer for PANDAS Network and our mission uh, is to basically help the community to understand science and to also educate everyone about the both basic and clinical research and to establish the guidelines for the future research that will be essential for the next decade or so in advancing both understanding of the disease 
as well as developing treatments that will benefit uh, children and also the community. Um, so uh, basically what I wanna do today is um, I wanna tell you about some exciting new research in the uh, laboratory that uh, we have done in terms of understanding sort of the mechanisms of blood brain barrier dysfunction and neuroinflammation that occurs after infections with group A strep infections. And uh, just as a few disclosures, this work that I'm going to present was uh, funded in part by the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, it was also funded by the, a small grant from the International OCD Foundation uh, and from the NIH through Columbia called Camper Basic Research. And of course, uh, from support from Penn as Network, Newport Equities, and as well as, as multiple donations from parents. Um, so basically uh, the lab is really excited and interested in understanding the function of the brain and how the brain uh, interacts with the periphery. And this interaction of the brain with the periphery occurs through an extensive network of vessels, of blood vessels that are illustrated here. So in this cartoon, we're only looking at a very small part of the brain. This is the part of the brain that is important for regulating how we move around. And you can see here that uh, is a very dense a vascularized organ and it closely interacts with the nerve cells depicted here in green and with the supportive um, cells of the brain called the glial cells, which are depicted here in yellow. Now, of course, um, this close interaction is important for many functions of the brain. It's important for basically how neurons communicate with each other because that process requires a lot of energy. But the other thing that blood vessels in the brain have that is kind of unique uh, to this organ and not really present in other organs of the body is the presence of this of a specialized barrier. This is illustrated in this movie here. What you're seeing in this movie is basically you're seeing, um, we're, we're imaging the blood vessels in the mouse brain. And you're seeing here that the cell-cell connections between the blood vessels are in green. And then in red, we have labeled the blood of the mice with like this red fluorophore uh, that allows us to visualize the vascular tree. But in addition to vas uh, um, visualizing the vascular tree, tree, what you're noticing here is that this, this, um, this red dye, this tracer that we have injected in the, in the blood in the mice doesn't enter the brain. And this is because basically the blood vessels in the brain have this unique property termed the blood-brain barrier. Now, if we zoom in really high level, then you can see here, this is basically a technique we call electron microscopy, but you can see this little structure here. This is basically this capillary here. You can see basically the vessel is surrounded by a dense neuropil. This is an astrocyte. These are nerve cells around it here. And then you can see this, uh, the, the endothelial cells make this very strong connections here called a structure called the tie junction, which is critical for this uh, formation of this barrier. And this barrier we've known for a long time is very critical for the function of the brain. So what you're seeing here is basically an, an animal model where we have this function of the, uh, uh, where we have induced ischemic stroke, which is a major disease that affects the humans, of course. And in the context of ischemic stroke, what you see here when you compare to the healthy side is that indeed the vessels become damaged now. And that red tracer that I said doesn't enter the brain now enters the brain because the structure of the tight junctions is disrupted. And so um, the presence of this barrier sort of raises a few important uh, questions. Now this barrier is also disrupted in neuroinflammatory diseases. And while most of us have studied multiple sclerosis as an example of a very prominent neuroinflammatory disease, 
we became interested in uh, basically to understand how potentially peripheral infections may affect the brain. And of course, now this concept is sort of well accepted, well understood, because you know we're almost at the end of our COVID pandemic after three years. The government declared today that the pandemic is over. However, I, I disagree because basically what we are going to see emerging is the secondary sequela of this pandemic. And one of the secondary uh, sequela of the COVID pandemic will be the neurological sequela that uh, I think have emerged with the uh, emergence of long COVID and will become a lot more prominent as we move forward. So um, I think one of the major questions we have had in the lab is to understand this interception of how a peripheral infection that triggers activation of the immune system, how that Im may impact the function of the brain. And of course, we've been interested in understanding this in the context of infections with group A strep. Now, group A strep is a gram-positive bacteria that is pathogenic to humans and triggers typically like a sore throat in children. It's very common infection in children, and children get lots of uh, sore throats. However, as the immune system starts fighting group A strep infections, it can generate um, an erroneous or abnormal immune response, and then begins to recognize the body as something foreign and begins to attack it. And so when that happens, uh, it can attack the heart, valves triggering rheumatic fever, it can attack the kidney, triggering glomerulonephritis. It can attack also the skin, triggering the manifestation of the scarlet fever. And one of the very well understood uh, neurological uh, effects uh, when it affects the brain that is um, triggered after rheumatic fever has been described in the literature as the Sinem score, and I'll go uh, there in more in detail. And in the 1990s, Susan Swedo, while she was working at the NIMH at the time, she also discovered a, a syndrome called PANDAS, which has a more a psychiatric manifestation. So what are these syndromes? So Sinem scoria has been known since the 19th century when it was first described in England. Uh, it's very common after severe group A strep infections. It targets a region of the brain termed the basal ganglia, and then what is thought is that indeed antibodies that circulate in our body that are triggered to fight group A strep infection somehow cross the, the you know, enter the brain via these S cells. And these antibodies uh, can target either dopamine receptors from the work of Madeleine Cunningham or also can uh, target other um, you know, populations of neurons in the basal ganglia, and this is work of Chris Pittinger at Yale University. However, what is in, important is that once these uh, antibodies enter the brain, they recognize certain proteins on the nerve cells, and once they uh, recognize these proteins, then trigger an abnormal behavior, and that behavior is seen with this uh, in cartoon here as an uncontrolled movement, obviously. But in addition to that, what we do know is that indeed the presence of these antibodies also triggers um, you know, a, a, system, a, a state of neuroinflammation. And so there is an, a, an immune cell of the brain called microglia. This is a resident immune cell of the brain that becomes dysfunctional. And I'll discuss this a little bit more later. But basically, uh, the constellation of the presence of the antibodies that target the nerve cells and the um, activation of these resident immune cells of the brain leads to this long-term, mostly neurological, but actually when it was first described in the 16th century, uh, sorry, 16th of 19th, uh, 17th century, not 19th century, it was noted that there are also psychiatric manifestations of this disease. Now, of course, uh, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep or PANDAS was obviously characterized by Susan Swedo in the 90s at the National Institute of Mental Health. And it's caused by repeated 
bouts of group A strep infection. There is evidence that the uh, antibodies target, again, the region of the basal ganglia we talked before. It has both motor but predominantly psychiatric manifestation and it's characterized by a sudden onset set. And as we know, a lot of the clinicians, um, you know, have a very difficult time diagnosing this disease. Some of, a lot of them don't even accept it uh, because uh, there has been a problem in terms of group A strep is very common. And, and so the, the, the clear association between strep infections and the psychiatric manifestations has been problematic. Um, and obviously, um, if we talk about PANS, which is pediatric, um, um, uh, acute onset neuropsychiatric disease, that becomes even more complicated because uh, clinically it looks very similar to PANDAS. However, the agents that trigger the disease are unknown. So the questions, of course, that we have been interested to understand about this disease since the start of my laboratory has been this question of how do these antibodies reach the brain? Because as I mentioned, the blood vessels in the brain are very different from the blood vessels in other organs. Um, the second question that we've been interested in is what uh, drives and sustain this state of inflammation of the brain, which is caused by this um, you know, resident immune cells of the brain to become hyperactivated. And then, of course, uh, can, uh, you know, if we understand the disease, can this lead to basically development of tools for either diagnostics of the disease or its treatment? In other words, this is really needed right now because there are very few biomarkers for the disease. And so to do that, in my lab, we basically model the disease in mice. Uh, mice are an excellent genetic model to study the disease. You can manipulate genes. They're easy to uh, um, grow. And so the way we have done it, this uh, approach in mice is we take juvenile young mice that have just been weaned from the mothers. We infect them with uh, in the nose with uh, group A strap, similar to the infection that you have in children. And then we do this uh, repeated infections to mirror what happens in children. Children also get repeated infections with group A strep. And then after about four to five infections, we uh, uh, isolate the brain to look at what happens in the brain. And so doing this approach, one thing that happens is as you infect the mice with group A strep, even though group A strep, you need more strep to infect the mice because mice are more resistant to infection than humans. What you see here is that the, the group A strep is completely isolated in the nose of the mice. It never goes in the brain. And so therefore, it's very clear. I want to make this distinction right now. It doesn't infect the brain. It only stays outside in the nose. However, as, it, uh, as it's present in the nose, it triggers a very strong immune response. And so you see here a lot of these red cells here. These are immune cells that are trying to like restrict the infection. And uh, but you know this nerve, this basically immune cells here in the nose are very close to a nerve cell called the olfactory neuron, which is important for the sense of smell. And so this nerve cell is responsible to take the information about the smell from the nose and and take it to the brain. And so this triggered our interest that perhaps this may serve as a route to go from the nose to the brain. In fact, this has been also postulated to occur in COVID. And in fact, that's what we saw in our first paper in 2016 that we published in collaboration with Patrick Leary at the University of Minnesota. What we did see is when we looked at the brains of these mice after multiple infections, which is the green line here, but not after one infection, which is the red line, or in mice that never had infection, this is the blue line, you can see that there is a large number of immune cells called T cells in the brains of these mice. And they're predominantly located in this uh, you know, anterior part of the brain, which is basically the, where the nerve cells of the, that are important for the sense of smell go and enter in the brain. So we think that basically these nerve cells serve as sort of a highway or a route 
for the immune cells to enter the brain. Now, of course, once they are in the brain, what we showed is that there are multiple complications that happen in the brain once those immune cells are there. Just as a reminder, again, the bacteria is never present in the brain. It's only in the periphery, but it has consequences because once those immune cells enter the brain, you get damage of the blood vessels. We showed that. You can see here basically a protein called serum IgG, which is also where potentially pathological antibodies are, now readily enters the brain. Uh, the second thing that we get is that we get uh, this state of activation of this resident immune cells of the brain called neuro, uh, in a situation called neuroinflammation. And you can also visualize this by PET imaging, uh, which is what Dr. Shugani has done with PENTA as children. And then the third thing that we see is that this has repercussions for the function of the nerve cells. So you can see here that one of the proteins that is important for nerve cell communication with each other, uh, this is called glutamate, is basically completely gone in the mice. And then you see that basically the nerve cells stop firing. So basically the communication of the nerve cells is completely apparent. And we know that all of these effects are happening because basically uh, the T cells are there. Now, um, this was work by a former talented graduate student, Miriam Platt, when she was in the lab. She's now a postdoc at Yale University. But I had another student that when she joined the lab, she wanted to understand this pathology at greater depth. And in order to understand this pathology at greater depth, what she did is that she took the, the brain of mice and then dissociated the cells of the brain into single cells and looked at these cells in terms of what RNAs or what uh, you know, protein, uh, what RNAs were different between brains of the mice that were healthy and the brains of the mice that had infection. And uh, the technique that she performed is, is now important for this audience, but this allows us to look globally at every single cell in the brain. How is it changing in response to infection? So what was interesting is that you can see here, this is sort of a bird's eye view of the map of these different cell types in the brain. Um, so we have the nerve cells, we have immune cells here, um, you know, immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils, we have resident immune cells of the brain, microglia, and then our favorite cells, endothelial cells. And when you look at the, this map projected now, whether it is a healthy mouse or a diseased mouse, the two cell types where we see major changes are basically the endothelial cells and these resident immune cells of the brain called the microglia. So I'm going to talk a, briefly a little bit about what we see. So when we look at the uh, cells, endothelial cells, what we see is that indeed upon infections, one group of genes that goes immediately down are genes that are important for this function or this bare function called the blood brain bearer. They completely go down. And what goes up is actually genes that are normally seen when you have inflammation. So the cells become very inflamed. They also completely shut down on the program for this barrier. And so that would lead to basically what we saw that would cause basically a leaky blood-brain barrier. And this is an example of one of the genes that is important for the blood-brain barrier here in, here in red. You can see that in the context of disease that is completely shut down. So the vessels now become leaky. So the second question that Charlotte had is what happens to these immune cells of the brain? So the immune cells of the brain are very plastic. So in normal healthy brain, they have a, a gene signature or, or, or a signature that is important to, to regulate normal brain function. And so that is called the homeostatic gene signature. And then in the context of disease, they upregulate a, a different group of, of transcript of genes that have been found in a large number of neurological diseases, including multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson. So these are called disease-associated genes because 
this group of genes goes up in any neurological disease that you see. And when we map this, you can see basically that the two groups uh, of, that are normally found in the healthy, uh, basically this is where the homeostatic genes are. And uh, the cells that are coming from the disease state, this is where all the disease associated genes are. So basically uh, what uh, the immune cells of the brain do in the context of this in, uh, infection, peripheral infection, a group A strep, they switch, they become from normal healthy cells to abnormal inflammatory cells. So what other things do they change dramatically? So they, they, they change dramatically three things. One of them is this, this process called antigen presentation, when where now these immune cells of the brain are talking to the T cells and triggering further activation of this peripheral immune system. Uh, the second one, is they begin to secrete a group of proteins called cytokines, which are used by the immune cells to communicate with one another. And basically this is a, a way to tell to the periphery, to the, to the immune cells in the blood, hey, come to the brain because there's something really bad happening in the brain. But in addition to having an effect on the immune cells in the periphery, they also have an effect on nerve cells. They have an effect effect on endothelial cells and other cell types in the brain. And the third is they also trigger activation of a um, particularly uh, pathway that has been uh, seen to be activated when you have viral infection, because basically the brain wants to respond to this particular inflammatory response. And so um, because of this, basically to summarize this, this first part, what's happening after repeated infections with group A strep, the immune cells enter the brain from the nose. And once they are in the brain, they change the cells of the brain. They change the endothelial cells to become basically leaky and inflammatory. They also change the resident immune cells of the brain called the microglia to become also very highly inflammatory. So the question is, um, you know, what can we do to, to mitigate this? And so one of the things that we did, obviously we know that uh, the infiltration of these T cells is important for triggering this pathology. Because in 2020, my graduate student, Marianne Platt, did this very beautiful experiment where she ablated the immune cells and um, basically the T17 lymphocytes. And when you do that, you can rescue most of the pathology. You can rescue the leakage of the barrier. You can rescue the dysfunction of the nerve cells. You can reduce activation of microglia. And in fact, now we have confirmed this using this new technology, and I'm not going to present those data here, but for the aficionados in the audience, I've also provided here the reference of the paper that we've put in the bioarchive, and you can read that in more in detail. But what happens in the mice where we ablate these TH17 lymphocytes, basically the, the microglial cells become more homeostatic. So they turn from disease cells to a, a healthier cells, even though these mice are getting infections with group A step. Basically, the, um, you know, the release of these inflammatory molecules is shut down. And the other thing that is shut down is basically the response to this uh, type 1 interferon. Now, something that is not shut down is basically the interaction of the T cells with it. So I think that interaction is still going on because basically the T cells are still in the, you know, there's still a few T cells in the brain and the microglia are still responding to that. But I think that in general, a lot of the pathology is actually rescued in these mice and the mice do a lot better. But of course, ablating these T cells is not useful for, hum for human treatments. And so we wanted to understand how we can address this from a therapeutic standpoint. Now the T cells that I'm talking about are these T cells that make this, uh, this inflammatory molecule called IL-17A. And so Charles had, had this idea, what if we do a therapeutic treatment where we block the function of IL-17 in this mice? Can we basically rescue the disease and mirror 
what we see in the mice where we don't have these lymphocytes. And that's what she did. She basically, uh, as she performed weekly uh, you know, infections with group A strep, she also administered in the mice an antibody that would target this protein IL-17. Now, this antibody is specific for the mouse protein, and I'll talk at the end of my talk, I'll talk about the human, pro human antibodies that can be used to target this protein. But what is interesting to say is that, indeed, the targeting of this, uh, this treatment did not inhibit, actually, the entry of the immune cells in the brain. However, it completely, it rescued very dramatically or very significantly the leakage of the blood-brain barrier. So the barrier was less leaky in these mice uh, that were treated with the IL-17A antibody. The other thing that was rescued when we looked at our favorite immune cells of the brain, the microglia, the cells now became expressed genes uh, that were more characteristic of the healthy brain than diseased brain. So they switched from a disease to a healthy state. They reduced expression of these uh, inflammatory molecules and the signaling. But similar to what we saw before, basically still the, the interaction of immune cells with T cells was quite high. So there's still interaction. They're still trying to talk to each other, but the downstream effects are completely mitigated. And so basically what this data said that IL-17 blockade is really critical, similar to the dele uh, deletion of these immune cells to really rescue a lot of the pathology. So let's get back to the human disease. What does this mean in terms for the clinical relevance? Because of course, we're, we're talking about mice and you all are scratching your head, why am I wasting my time sitting in this webinar? I wanna talk about human disease. So are there diagnostic tools for testing, monitoring, treatment therapies, or developing new therapies? And so one of the questions we had in the, in the lab is to what extent some of these uh, cytokines, these like bad uh, cells that uh, allow immune cells to communicate with one another that we detect in mice, to what extent we can detect those in the human disease? And so to perform this study, um, Tyler Cutworth, a former associate research scientist in the lab, uh, basically uh, in collaboration with NIMH and the Columbia Pediatric Neurology, particularly Wendy Vargas when she was still here at Columbia, they had a, they um, accumulated a sera from the blood of either healthy controls um, or pan tatas and pans children that were either given to us by Susan Swedoff when she was at the NIMH or basically collected here at Columbia. And so what he did is then basically he performed an essay where he looked at the expression of this 45 of these different cytokines and chemokines in the blood of patients. And as you can see here, these are some of the most significant ones. So there are a lot of chemokines here. Uh, the one in red are the ones that are made by our favorite cells, the microglia. Now, there are some that are important for TH17, like IL-22 and IL-23, but you can see that basically the, the sera of the children with pandas and pans at the very acute state of the disease express or have a lot of these inflammatory cytokines, suggesting to us that this is an inflammatory, neuroinflammatory disease. And in fact, when we look at the expression of this, some of the very important ones, they're highly elevated in the sera of children with pandas and pans compared to the healthy controls. And um, you know, these are some of these are so high. For example, look at this CCL5, whereas in healthy controls is basically like 20 in children is at approximately 300, so about 10 fold upregulated. That is a massive effect in the acute phase of the disease. Also, this protein GMCSF, which is made by T17 lymphocytes, massively upregulated in the sera of the children at the acute phase of the disease. And this is serum in the blood. This is not CSF. So basically, what we are seeing is basically an, a convergence of our mouse studies with the human studies, which is actually kind of 
amazing in itself. I mean, I almost fell off the chair when I actually saw this because, you know, you hope that the, the mouse studies will have some relevance for the human disease, but you never know. But literally, like what we found is that these very cytokines that are highly upregulated in the human sera um, basically are made by these resident immune cells of the brain. And so these we think can be wonderful or interesting potential biomarkers that one can use at the acute phase of the disease to diagnose the disease. And I want to point out that these are not present when the children get just strep infections, but not PANDA. So these are very specific for the disease. So the, the, the next question we had is, uh, can, uh, can the sera from the, the children trigger changes in the blood brain barrier? And this has been a question we've asked, we've been uh, interested for a while, but in order to address that, we collaborated with Dr. Arim Peterson at the St. Elon Institute uh, which I think is here in the audience, to build this human neurovascular unit in a dish, to build a brain in a dish. And so basically uh, for this, we use a platform called the Memeras platform. It doesn't matter, but basically in this platform, we can form the vessels on one side. And then on the other side, we have the nerve cells here and the uh, support cells glia. And then we also can a flow, uh, either media or sera or blood in this. So it's a beautiful 3D system that we're building to really address this question. And what is interesting is when we did this experiment we are with either the healthy serum or with a serum from PANDAS children that we had in the lab, we, and then we looked at the permeability of the vasculature, well, similar to what we saw in the mice, is we saw that within two days, the serum from the pandas children was able to trigger massive uh, leakage of the vessels, uh, basically indicative that indeed it actively promotes um, vascular dysfunction. So therefore, this is actually a beautiful evidence in vivo that of using this 3D system that indeed this can be a powerful tool to study what's happening in the syrup from these children. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of the uh, clinical relevance? I think basically based on our data, there should be no doubt right now in the mind of anyone that PANAS or PANS is a neuroinflammatory disease. Whether it is an autoimmune disease or not, it's, it's questionable, but definitely it's a neuroinflammatory disease. Is, because we can see inflammatory cytokines in patients, sera, and we know that a lot of these inflammatory cytokines, as I said, are coming from the resident immune cells of the brain and the immune cells that circulate in the blood. And so this panel can be used both for diagnostic tools. It can also be used to monitor treatment because we anticipate that in patients who are in the phase of the remission or completely remitted, some of these inflammatory cytokines will go down, probably all of them. And also uh, drugs that probably target the neuroinflammatory response may be beneficial for long-term treatment. So, I've, so I wanna talk briefly about the drug therapies because I think our study also raises important implications about development of new therapy is for the disease. Obviously, based on the mouse work, we know that IL-17 blockade is critical to ameliorate all the pathology in the mouse, to basically uh, restore the function of the blood-brain barrier, to make the resident immune cells of the brain quiescent so they perform normal function, and basically um, to like, uh, we still need to understand whether it can restore the nerve function. But um, basically, the, there are already drugs that are present for treatment of a lot of autoimmune disease that target this very protein. So uh, Novartis have actually has a functional antibody that targets the human IL-17 called Consentix or um, secu uh, Secuquinumab. Uh, Consentix is the common name. And then IL-23, which we actually have seen is highly elevated in the CRA from pandas and pans 
is also can be targeted using this drug, Ustekinumab from Johnson's lab. Now, these drugs have been FDA approved for treatment of several diseases like ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, even in children, adolescents, or adults, psoriatic arthritis, and then the ALF-23 for the treatment of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But of course, there is one major contraindication, which is an active infection. And so what I think this, this suggests is that we cannot use these drugs when there is an active infection. Before fighting the infection, peripheral infection with antibiotics, you can't use these drugs. But in the context of a severe disease where obviously you have, filed, you have first treated the infection, but you don't see an amelioration of the, of the, of the disease, I think rather than doing multiple IVIGs and plasma phoresis for severe patients with PANDAS and PANS, this could be a, a, a potential alternative route. And with that, I wanna thank the people in the lab who have done the work. Obviously, uh, this work began uh, the first paper with beautiful work by Erica Smith, who is not even here in this picture. And then in 2020, Marion Platt, who is pictured right here, did this beautiful paper where she eliminated TH17 lymphocyte. And the work on the mouse IL-17 blockade is done by a former talented graduate student, Charlotte Wayne. She's now a postdoc at the Rockefeller University. And obviously uh, the, um, the work right now is being carried out by a postdoc, Urak Chan. And then Dr. Ali Kurt, who is actually pictured right here, he's a clinical coordinator for our clinical studies. And, um, you know, replacing Michael Tintinin, who was in the lab. Of course, uh, we want to thank our collaborators. In particular, I want to highlight here Dr. Erin Patterson, uh, who is a long standing collaborator for the in vitro uh, human BBB model. And of course, the, the funding. And with this, I will take questions or we'll start the Q&A session. Hi, everybody. It's Diana and Stacy. Thank you, Dr. Agayu. That was really amazing. And it was great to hear that you almost fell off your chair when you heard, when you saw the evidence. So. I did because, you know, we, we always hope that the mouse models will tell us something about the human disease, but obviously there are major differences between um, the models we have in mice and the human studies. And so it's, it's important to validate. Right. And some of the, we're going to um, have some, we've staged some questions. Parents asked us earlier various um, questions. But before I get into that, what I wanted to say to the parents listening, and for the sake of this recording, as people listen in the future, that the business of creating science that can then be used for uh, health and healing people for creating drugs as well is a laborious process, but it's absolutely necessary because we can't guess about what's happening. So thank you for your laborious effort. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I mean, it's, uh, you know, of course, I, I am very, I was curious about this disease, like the first time we met, and as you know, I was still a postdoc at Stanford and, you know, I didn't know much about disease at the time. But I think the more and more I work on it, the more I'm intrigued and fascinated because I think there's very little we understand. And of course, this disease, unlike stroke and MS, is, is sort of an orphan disease because very few people work on it. And I think I think it's I feel an obligation to the community to, to really continue the work and because I think it's important to the children first for their health, but to everyone as well. You know, and as parents, we really, I certainly didn't appreciate when, when I first met you, um, you know, what rigor there is and standards scientifically to prove debilitating, particularly debilitating illnesses. There's a really high standard. So thank you for being one of the few that has managed to help us understand what's going on. So let me go to the, one of the first question that I am very interested in myself. Here's the question. My 10-year-old daughter was diagnosed by a neurologist with Sydenham Korea. 
She was also diagnosed with rheumatic fever because of reoccurring strep infections. Later, a pediatrician said, no, this is pandas. The neurologist disagreed and said, pandas doesn't exist. Is there a way, Dr. Iga Yu, to, treat, to truly figure out which one it is? And also, what's the difference between the two if they are two distinct diseases? So the, definitely there is a distinction, as I explained at the very beginning of my talk. So, you know, typically the um, after rheumatic fever, the, the most common form of neurological manifestation that you see is Sidon's chorea, and that has been well documented in the literature. And as a disease, it's a predominantly a movement abnormality disease, right? Um, it's chorea, which is basically, that's what it means, abnormal movements, because it's affecting the function of the basal ganglia. Um, however, even in the initial descriptions of the synonyms chorea, there was clear evidence that some of these patients did have psychiatric manifestations. And so, right. uh, and in the case of pandas, we do know that even though the psychiatric aspects are very severe and sudden onset, there are also some neurological diseases. And so I know that neurology and psychiatry like to keep their fields separate because of course that they, you know, they look at different aspects, but there could be, there is some intersection there, of course. Okay. So it's still up for debate how people- Well, it's not, too. it's not, um, so it's very clear you can diagnose Sinem's chorea very clearly. The, the thing is, it's a disease that was very pre prevalent and predominant when, you know, there were um, the strep infections were very severe. There were no antibiotic right. treatment. And it's still very predominant in the developing and third world countries. But I think, um, you know, um, much less prominent here. And I think a lot of the clinicians probably are, are not very well trained or informed of Palestinian Korea that, as well. That's definitely something that we're seeing at Pandas Network, that there is a lack of training for Sydenham and for Pandas, but we're here to try to save the day. <laughs> we're going to try. I'm, I'm not a clinician, so I can't yeah. comment on the training and I can comment on, you know, nuanced aspects of each of the DECs, but my understanding is, of course, that there are clear distinctions and um, that I think that, uh, you know, the that it, it takes about six months from where you can see from the rheumatic fever to Sinem's chorea in terms of development, whereas I thought, of, I think that pain is more an acute onset, but um, I think that's um, still a matter of a lot of discussion. Right, right, very good. Um, Stacy, do you want to ask the next? Yes. So the next question is, can you please talk about the patent you are pursuing for a treatment that could work on pandas pans and what the next steps would be? Since pandas and pans is heterogeneous genetically, how do we discern which subset would benefit from an AL, IL-17A drug? So there are two questions there. Yes. So we have um, filed a patent to basically repurpose the use of uh, IL-17 drugs such as Consentix for the treatment of severe pains based on the work that I just described. Um, obviously, I think that, um, you know, um, we do think based on the mouse studies that there is a potential that it could work in severe pains. Obviously, I discussed that one of the things you have to make sure is that there is no active infection because obviously you can't give these drugs when there is active infection because that infection will spread, oh. uh, and that and that can be can be tr can be tr uh, you know problematic I think particularly if uh, the source of infection is not treated well. It's However, really important for parents. Sorry to interrupt you to to hear that that don't try to, is to persuade your doctor to give you these drugs until the treat the infection is cleared up. Yeah, so and so really I think that for us, what what I would suggest based on you know that basically the antibiotics would be the first line of treatment, particularly when you have pandas and you have an 
documented evidence of infection to treat that infection. Um, and obviously, based on uh, discussions that I've had with clinicians, it's very evident that uh, a lot of kids do well after treatment with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. But um, in cases of very severe, where basically you need constant IVRG or plasma phoresis to treat the disease, and the disease is non-relenting despite these treatments, I think that could be um, a potential candidate where these uh, very severe therapies could be considered because they do have a lot of side effects and they're, they're, they can be pretty strong, that they're very strong therapies. Right. So we have a lot of questions, some from adults. Um, I saw some questions from women on the East Coast that I know, and some from young adults that are relapsing. They could potentially use one of these therapeutic drugs, but we're not at the point yet. Perhaps we'll have more seminars. We certainly will. With I think that's drugs. important before you even jump, I think we need to, I think it will be important to do some of the clinical trials, but obviously um, with this be before you can even like proceed with the treatment. However, because it is an FDA approved drugs, I think, for example, if your child suffers from an autoimmune disease, for example, ankylosing spondylitis and has pants, that definitely be, that child becomes automatic for the treatment with this disease. And I think that would be important to see, you know, how are the secondary effects of pain, does our pants, you know, affected once you start the treatment because you have another underlying autoimmune disease. And that, you know, that ties, this is a little sophisticated for, for new parents uh, to comprehend all of this, but that's part of the problem with defining PANDAS as a psych disease or Sydenham Korea or PANDAS as a neurological disease. We have to hash out if there's actually an autoimmune process or an immune process going, and we're just beginning to figure out how to do that testing. So um, definitely, child, I, think, I think we have evidence that the CIRA themselves um, have, you know, these markers of neuroinflammation. And obviously from the work from both Madeline Cunningham and Chris Pittinger, there is evidence that there are circulating antibodies, at least in pen, uh, that are targeting the brain. Um, and so, um, you know, it's sort of a dual process, but I think that um, potentially, um, I think even particular IL-23 targeting would be even more beneficial in some way because IL-23 is highly upregulated in the, in the kids. And so it could be potentially beneficial. IL-23 and IL-17A are two interleukins that you're seeing that are very high in the pandas kids. Correct. And right. they both target the same cell, T17 cell. Okay. One is actually required to induce L17, the other is the effector, but that's okay. more complicated for the solvents, obviously. Okay. So um, we have another question. It feeds into this. Have any genes been identified for individuals to have a greater susceptibility for PANDAS? And at the same token, has COVID-19 helped increase interest in PANDAS and looking at genetic factors in COVID too? Or is there an overlap? Um, yes, so, um, so definitely um, there are considerations to develop vaccines for group A strep infections. In fact, Victor Nizet at UCSD is actually kind of developing this like vaccine treatments to target group A strap. Um, those could be potentially very beneficial. Um, you know, similar to how we um, became, you know, we were able to fight this pandemic because we were immunized against COVID, right? But um, obviously it's not the whole story because sometimes you can still get an infection even if you are, when you are immunized, and sometimes you could have secondary sequela, but maybe for the community, particularly those who are affected by pen, as will benefit from a treatment with a vaccine. Is there a gene that has been found for pandas or pans? Um, so I think there are a couple. So um, of course the 
Rosario Trifiletti and colleagues have published a study where they have identified some of the candidates in a very severe pens. We also have conducted a genetic study that we're working on uh, publishing now, where we have identified several risk factors and a subset of these risk factors are those targeting the immune cells. So definitely, I think there is a genetic component to the disease that could tie up uh, with what we understand about the disease. Great. Spacey. All right. So the next question is, some children seem better with IVIG or treatments over time. Are they considered cured? And did their blood-brain barrier close? Yeah, so nobody really knows how IVIG works. But one of the ways in which IVIG works, it definitely doesn't close the blood-brain barrier. What it does is it competes with these pathological antibodies that are present in the blood. Um, so as it, it dilutes them down. And so in a way, it's sort of a, uh, a sort of a patch therapy that could work temporarily, but it's certainly not uh, a long-term treatment therapy. Um, you know, it does have effect, the IVIG uh, treatment does have effect on a group of immune cells called the B cells, which produce this pathological antibodies. But again, the effects are very temporary and and um, I, I think certainly based on the our findings, I think it's you're better off targeting the neuro the inflammation with steroids than IVIGs. Okay. Question number five. What would be the long-term prognosis of a pandas pans child if they never had treatment, if I don't do anything? and just let it run its course. And why won't an MRI or blood test show anything significant? What am I supposed to do if there isn't any evidence? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a very good question. It's a question that I think we are, it's hard to understand, but one of the things that we have seen, at least in our mouse model is that these uh, immune cells, T cells do persist in the brain for a very long time. Um, and uh, we are just beginning to understand a little bit more in depth what happens in the long term uh, in the brain. Um, so I do think that if, it, if left untreated, perhaps there is a, so let's take an example like multiple sclerosis. It's a classical autoimmune disease where the immune cells attack the nerve cells, the, the, the a myelin called the myelin sheath that basically surrounds the nerve cells. And if you keep, if you don't treat this disease over time, you know, you have basically constant attack. And so you have disease going at a peak state, disease relapsing, uh, but eventually that disease will become secondary progressive relatively quickly. And a lot of the drugs we have for target in MS are really to like basically keep this state of the relapse or emitting at like in check. So you don't mm -hmm. progress to that secondary mm -hmm. damage, which leads to like complete loss of nerve cells and neurodegeneration. So if we take that into consideration, I think that's what we're worried that would happen if you were to leave this disease completely untreated. You know, I, I'm gonna um, do something I probably shouldn't do, but I'll just say this, Stacy and I, you know, work on Pandas Network and other, we've had many volunteers over the years who have helped or continue to help behind the scenes. And we do this because we got our kids better with, yes, steroids sometimes, and together with IVIG. And there isn't a magic answer about some people are asking questions, is steroids better than IVIG? There isn't a perfect answer, but um, IVIG worked very well for my children. So different genetics, some people's genetics are more intense than others. And Absolutely. I, I completely agree. There isn't like a cookie, cookie cut uh, treatment, obviously, so, you know, like one treatment fits all. So uh, Stacey and I, I think that that there will be different therapies.
is. And, and Stacy and I and you, Dr. Um, Agayu, answer questions because we knew new there's we had 900 people sign up for this event and I recognized only like 150 of those 900 names. We'll be sending everybody video links of this recording after the event. But um, newcomers, we do worry about new mommies and daddies with little kids that they're not treating quickly enough. And so we appreciate, you know, this dialogue mm -hmm. because it's important to think about it. Yeah, I think I think it's very important because, you, you know, the, the other question was like, why doesn't MRI and blast testing show anything significant? I don't think there has been that many detailed studies of MRI. Yeah to be honest, particularly when you go in the relapse phase of the disease. Um, certainly in the acute phase of the disease, you see MRI changes. Um, definitely there have not been systematic studies using PET imaging, where you, which would detect the activation of microglia because these studies are very hard to do in the children. But um, I think certainly I would be in shock if there were no effects because yeah. you definitely would see it. Yeah. yeah, and because of lack of funding, if anybody has you know an extra several million dollars sitting around, you know, Stanford University and Kyle Williams also at Harvard did some MRI work that was really compelling, but it's just not openly available yet because the studies weren't large enough and long enough. Well, they're not large and they're quite expensive to do yes. those at this, unfortunately. So yeah. Stacy, the next question. Yes. So the next question is why when the behavioral issues associated with PANS have finally subsided, does another exposure and not actually getting the virus or infection cause PANS to start right back up again? And does this also happen in Sydenham, Korea? Um, can you repeat the question one more time, Stacey? Yes. Why, when the behavioral issues associated oh. with PANS have finally subsided, does another exposure cause PANS to start right back up again? And does that also happen in Sydenham, Korea? Um, so uh, I will say I don't know Sydenham, Korea, but I would postulate yes. But I think that one of the ideas that we have is when you have a, another uh, infection, you basically like will, of course, reactivate the immune response and will trigger more immune cells to enter the brain, which then in turn would basically exacerbate the disease. Um, so that's why I think that if you have another exposure, like, you know, the child goes to school and, you know, some of his friends are, um, you know, have group A strep infections, you will see basically a reactivation of those behaviors. Symptoms. Okay, question number seven. This always confuses me. Okay, could there be a treatment using, quote, neutralizing antibodies like what was used in, in COVID-19 for severe cases when people went to the hospital and were really sick? How do we create a treatment like this neutralizing antibodies? And will the Yale work, the $5 million that Yale got from the NIMH, will that help with creating a neutralizing antibody treatment? So the problem is that you can create a neutralizing antibody to a virus if you know what the virus is. In the case of COVID-19, we know what the virus is, it's SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's the virus that causes the disease. In case of PANS, this is problematic because basically, you know, the 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 agent is is really unknown. You know, in pen does the agent is known, but sometimes it's hard even to catch the group based infection unless you know you're oh. fortunate to to have it. And so I don't think that you would basically like even develop a therapy that would target the pathogen. However, the therapy I just described is a neutralizing antibody therapy. Now, toward the IL-17 or IL-23, the, the very cytokines that are, you know, detrimental for the pathology in the brain. So they are neutralizing therapies. They're not targeting the pathogen, but they're targeting this specific cytokines. Okay, very good. Very hopeful. And uh, the, the Yale uh, uh, grant is really focused on understanding 
how the pathological antibodies affect the function of the neurons. Uh, there is it's not related to the basically anti, you know, it's it's not relating to the idea of the neutralizing antibody. They're just trying to see the damage. What exactly? What is they're, going they're trying to it. understand mechanistically. Uh, you know, like what? How how are these antibodies that circulate in the blood affect the function of the nerve cells and per, in particular a group of nerve cells in the base? And how bad is, is the very damage? Important. Bad, how exactly. bad the damage is? And that's exactly what which is a very important question, of course, but a different question from what was asked. Thank you. Okay, Stacy, and then you're going to continue with more questions, Stacy, uh, from the chat after this last question. We're going Correct. to go until uh, the the end of the hour, seven seven thirty East Coast time, and then uh, we'll be sending the video um, mm -hmm. uploaded to everybody after the event. With yes, them. and I just wanted to remind everyone too. I know we have over a hundred questions in the chat alone, so obviously we're not going to get to everybody's questions, but we will when we send the video and the email. We'll also answer more questions that way so be, please be patient with us these are all really good questions and it would be great if we could get to all of them today but that's just not possible um so the the last question that we're going to answer from the submitted questions ahead of time is can you touch upon chronic recurring strep in older or teenage pandas patients and treatment and does having your tonsils out help alleviate pandas and yeah, strep. so and strep. Yeah. yeah. Uh I mean, uh, so I think that th this is a very good question in terms of like how uh you know chronic uh, untreated chronic infections can affect older. Um certainly they do. And I think that's something that is sort of an open question and uh would be very it's an important area of research to continue. You know. Um, I think that's an area that is as important as looking in the young children. Um, just to answer this question a little bit briefly, there is a, a, a very important research done at the OCD clinic here at Columbia, which is looking in the adult OCD patients and the response to cognitive behavior therapy. And what they're finding is that a subset of these patients don't respond at all to cognitive behavior therapy. And uh, you know they have some very interesting evidence suggesting that that could be a neuroinflammatory in nature. And so potentially there is this, this theory that some of those patients could have been patients that had a milder form of pandas or pans, that eventually they developed adult obsessive compulsive disorders that are not treated with the normal cognitive behavior therapy or they need a combination of therapy. But I think that's um, uh, research is that the infancy will be really interesting to see mm -hmm. how it develops. You take, to bet some people when they get lots of strep, taking their tonsils out. Well, first of all, how do you help some people stop getting a lot of strep? Was one of the questions. And does taking tonsils out help? I don't think you can control strep infection. Because mm -hmm. strep is so prevalent in the population that, you know, if you live in like a city like I live in New York City, good luck. It's going to be really hard to like control. It's very prevalent in children, in children in kindergarten, school. You know, it's really hard to control strep in actions, um, I think, uh, in in a community-based setting because it's it's around, it's all around actually. But some yeah. people do get it a lot. Um, yeah, they, so- They need to they, be more careful. Uh, so there, there are those who are carriers who basically like have uh, the, the bacteria around in their tonsils, but they, they never show signs of disease, right? And um, you know, those are, should be careful. And I think if you had a child with pandas or pans, I think continuous screening, to make sure that no one in the family has the bacteria who is important um, and, you know, um, taking precautions. But it's, I think it would be very hard to control the spread. 
Okay. In my view, I think, uh, you know, I, I would be happy to hear that, alternatives. That's a separate question for an infectious disease doctor, probably, too. Yes. So and uh, certainly there was some research done by Tanya Murphy a while ago saying that tonsillectomy doesn't fully help. But I think um, the problem is that in children, you know, there, there are several. So tonsils are one part of the, uh, you know, the um, uh, sort of where a lot of the immune cells against strep reside, but there's also a lot of uh, other Im immune um, regions called the adenoids, which are very at the back. Right, uh, the tonsils and, and the adenoids. And so even if sometimes you remove the tonsils, the adenoids could be a source of infection, but um, it certainly would be helpful, but I think more research is, is needed, obviously. Definitely, uh, we did see that a lot of the IL in the 2016 paper when we collaborated with Dr. Latimer and Dr. Earl Harley, we did so see that patients, PEMDAS patients, tonsils have a lot of these T cells that respond to group A strep infection. So certainly it's very clear that obviously these T cells are present in the tonsils. Um, Oh. Stacy, um, would you like to continue with um, the questions from the chat box, please? Yes. So one thing that, or one question that continues to come up in various ways is just addressing adults. Um, so I know we've touched on it briefly, yeah. but what else can we discuss when it comes to adults some of the we get these a lot whether it's through emails on social media posts and now a lot of the chat is about it so overall when it comes to adults can adults be treated for this and um another question we get a lot is will there be any sort of research on this in adults adults is what a lot of families feel is overlooked um, I think it's a very good question. I feel that um, it really depends on, so when you go to like adolescents and adults, it really depends a lot whether they have ever received treatment or not. Because if they've never received treatment, the likelihood that disease entered, has entered a different stage called the chronic stage is probably a lot higher. And unfortunately, for that type of a disease, we um, there's very little research. I know that uh, Jenny Frankovich at Stanford is collecting samples from, well, not adults, but children with chronic, but I think it could be an interesting, I think, uh, aspects to begin to look into the sera from the adults and see whether some of the signatures that we see in the pediatric are also present in the adults. Um, certainly we haven't, we haven't done that study in mice, uh, but I think one of the uh, aspects that my current postdoc, Urak Chan, is very interested in is really looking at the long-term effects of the strep infection if you leave the mice untreated and seeing like what happens to them like long-term, like as they age. And I think that that would be a very interesting question to address this like transition from an adolescent to an adult in an untreated um, infection. Uh, uh, Stacey, I know you have more questions, but I just wanted, people are asking what the term chronic means really. Like if a child seems to be all better after IVIG or whatever treatment, then they're no longer chronic. But chronic means you don't feel good day after day after day for many right. so, years. Yes, it's, let it's me explain that. So, okay. so what I meant by the relapse in remitting is basically the relapse is a, a, a term, a, a medical term, when basically the disease appears again, right? And then the remission is basically when the disease disappears. And that remission could be because you're either using treatment or sometimes even without treatment. I think it's very rare in cancer of pans and pans, but on, you know, the that, but basically with the treatment, you get that relapse. In the chronic, no matter what you do, the disease is still there. It's very strong, it's very severe. And so, Basically, that's what we call the chronic stage, where you have had this disease for such a long time and 
basically nothing is working and you're still having a very severe symptoms for a prolonged period of time. So typically I would say chronic would be for adolescents and adults, you know, uh, because in children, we still don't know like, you know, what stage they are. But I mean, some children who started having the disease three or four by age 13, 14, they could be chronic if the disease has been there for 10 years or more, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the, definition, seeing... the definition, the clinical definitions are completely, I think, unclear about the pants, relapse, remission, chronic. This is not MS. Even for MS, sometimes the definitions are difficult. Stacy, um, mm-hmm. we have a few a time for a few more questions, then I know we need to adjourn in, in about 10 minutes. Definitely. Um, so another question, and this was asked in a few different ways as well, is do we have a test for cytokines or would a doctor know how to do this type of test? Yeah, so that's a very important question. Um, so certainly, I don't think that you, you can do a, I don't think a, a, a diagnostic test is available for all the cytokines we do. That's just a research based. But I think that, that you know, for it, a lot of autoimmune diseases, some of these cytokines, you can do a lot of testing for these cytokines. And so based on our published work that now is in bioarchive, it's under review, you know, you could potentially be asking the doctor to look at very specific cytokines and see whether those are changing or that they're highly upregulated in the patient. But again, I'm, I'm not a clinician. And so I think a clinician will be better suited to answer this question. Can people check uh, IL-17A and <laughs> IL-23, just those two? Well, I will just not put only those two because uh, some of the very potent ones that we actually saw have dramatic effect on the barrier are actually chemokines. Uh, it's a different population of immune oh, the CCL5. cells. Yeah, the CCL5, CCL2, CCL3. So I would hate to give this recommendation only for two because basically we saw at least 10 of them that are very, very highly elevated. Now, obviously, you can do all of them, but I think that um, I would say talk to a, a specialist like a rheumatologist or, rheumatologist. you know, to see if you can do some of this. Okay. And certainly, I think when we have the webinar with the clinicians, this would be something to discuss, of course. So we're working on the testing, developing that. Okay. Not yet for everybody. Okay, Stacey. Um, I, the next thing I'm more of a comment, but also summarizing a question too. So through the um, questions submitted prior and the chat, there's a lot of questions about what treatment would be right for someone's child. And I just want to go back to what you said earlier, Dr. Agayu, about how there's no cookie cutter approach. And I know that as a community and as parents, we are in a position where we, tr- we, we form together and it's really a parent-driven community with how we help one another and support one another. But at the same time, I know that when we reach out to one another and we dialogue on the different platforms that are available, I, I see a lot of, you know, what, what should I do for my child? And then one parent says, do this. Another parent says, do that. And then another parent says, no, don't do that. This is what helped my child. And so you can really go down this rabbit hole of your head spinning of what will work for my child. I can't reiterate enough how important it is to work with a specialist who can really guide you. And it's hard because a a lot of people have to travel for specialists or, you know, travel out of state for it but it's so important that you do work with a a specialist that can guide you because treatments work different for different children, for different symptoms, for different stages of the disorder. And on our website, we do have a button at the top that says find help nearby. If you need help looking for a provider in your state, um, that can really get you on the right track. Yeah, so I wanted to iterate that a little bit because I had also... I've been monitoring the chat a little bit, and there's a lot of questions about the therapy. Obviously, I do think IVIG works, 
Um, so um, certainly if it has worked and it's working, I think it's, it's still a good idea to continue with it. And what I describe is not really a, a therapy that should be replacing the existing therapies. But I do think that I want to make it clear, we see evidence of inflammation, both peripheral inflammation and neuroinflammation. And so one of the ways to mitigate that is basically steroids, um, maybe non-steroid anti-inflammatory treatments can work, but those work only in the form where there's a mild form of the disease. When you get to a very severe form of the disease, they tend to be, you know, not very helpful. But I think certainly they could be, um, those could be potentially an, a first target uh, in conjunction with an antibiotic treatment. Um, and then I think what I described would be probably more relevant if there is a very severe form of the disease, obviously. So um, I think certainly it's important to consider all the options, to consider antibiotic treatment, uh, to consider treatment to mitigate or slow down the inflammation with either non-steroids, although I would say that they're not super helpful in the brain, steroid treatments, and then obviously IVAGs and plasmaphoresis works really well also to clear all those pathological antibodies, right? But again, they're not permanent because those immune cells that make the antibodies are still there. Um, and obviously, there are con um, considerations to target those very immune cells, the B cells, with rituximab, and that could potentially be an important uh, treatment avenue. Um, there are certainly, um, I think that the challenge here is that we still have this umbrella of a disease uh, that we call PANS because of the clinical manifestations, but this could be multiple diseases. Jesus. Uh, that we don't understand well. And in fact, we don't understand at all. What? And so until we really fully understand them, I think it's going to be a challenge to um, basically treat them correctly. But I think what I can say is that regardless whether the cohort we got from Susan Swedo, which was a pure PANDAS cohort, because she curated that cohort very carefully, the cohort we had at Columbia was mostly PANS because we couldn't identify the group A strap in the patients. We still saw very similar changes in the cytokine signature. So that suggested that central to this disease is this prominent inflammatory response you see in the periphery that could be a result of the inflammation in the brain, as well as the activation of the peripheral immune system. Um, okay, I, we've run out of time now, yes. and I have so many more things I could say and ask, and I'll have to stop myself, mm -hmm. but I really appreciate doing this um, this event with you, Jutan, and um, we'll have another event for doctors and researchers focusing on that with Pandas Physicians Network. They're going to be promoting that. We really hope um, that you guys promote that. We're going to record everything. This is our first time doing this as Pandas Network. So we'll record it. We're going to send everybody the link. We're also going to try to try to transcribe a lot of the questions and get them answered. And we'll email that out too. So yeah. uh, we just want to get the show on the road and start getting people answers. And we we'll, hopefully we'll do some more webinars to talk about yeah. the science and treatment. And, and I also want to say that partly the reason we're doing the webinar for physicians in collaboration with PANDAS Physician Network and PANDAS Network is that that would be a more advanced dialogue with the clinicians and physician scientists to really kind of discuss these issues uh, and to basically potentially, you know, expand at with, with other clinicians because we really, you know, we're at the infancy of understanding this. And I think the more studies are done, you know, sci uh, you know, medicine is a numbers game at the end of the day, because humans, unlike mice, are extremely variable. And so, um, you know, we have just started the tip of the iceberg with a small number of cases. It would be very important to expand this so that we can validate what we found in very large other cohorts. And I think 
this will be really important. And I hope that the webinar we have in at the end of June with physicians will actually galvanize a lot of the clinical research that is based on our initial is sick research studies. Yes, thank you. And parents, we're, we're pushing from behind the scenes as best we can. A lot of people are to get broader support and dialogue. So thank you for being pioneers with us. Thank you, Stacy, for all of your support and support and um, Andrew Tan also. And I want to thank Pandas Network for this, uh, for organizing this webinar. Both uh, Diana and Stacy have worked very hard behind the curtains to make this happen. So thank you very much for Absolutely. hosting me. Thank you. I'm thank from the you. West Coast. Stacy's in the Midwest. You can if you're on the East Coast. We got the yes, nation covered. I we got the country under wraps here. <laughs> have a good, have a good one. night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.